had a lot of illusions about Earth. One of them was that it was basically flat and infinite with no finitude to our resources. And we had very stereotyped ideas of what the Earth looked like from space. You look at all the images that people made before we had the photographs, uh, almost none of them have clouds and weather and climate. There's such a thing as icons, and icons help frame people's thinking. My sense was that a photograph of Earth from space would be different in every possible way from a painting of the Earth from space. In uh, 1966, I uh, took some LSD on a rooftop in San Francisco. I noticed that the buildings of downtown were not parallel to one another. It was as if you were looking with a fisheye lens. They had this uh, slightly divergent quality to them. So basically, I'm mentally elevating myself higher and higher and higher until the horizon closes around me in a circle. What I'm looking at is the surface of a sphere. I was just trying to call forth that reality. And what I thought was, you know, taking my what, 100 mics of LSD on a rooftop, I know that I'll just make a button. I come up with a phrasing that I like, why haven't we seen a photograph of the whole Earth yet? I'll distribute the button through the world and everybody will understand we need to see a photograph of the whole Earth. And when we do, everything will be different. So I printed up a bunch of these buttons and I went around to various universities and sold the buttons for 25 cents a piece. I sent them to Buckminster Fuller and Marshall McLuhan and all the senators that, and their secretaries that I could find. I sent them to various professionals at NASA and Politburo members in Russia. I just you know, floated this stuff out there, see what would happen. At that time, you know, in the late 60s, the whole Earth catalog became kind of the Sears catalog of the Back to the Land generation with this intelligence behind it of Stewart's. Stewart's motto was, we are as gods and we might as well get good at it. The whole Earth catalog had uh Basically, appropriate technology is our contribution. Photovoltaic, things that you could put on your roof that you would get 12 volt power out of. That was deemed uh, appropriate technology. Putting something in a creek that would pump water was appropriate technology. Geodesic domes and, and solar uh, equipment. Organic gardening in that sense was appropriate technology. People are going back to the land, back to basics, reinvent civilization, get it right this time. And uh, the sense was that was one was gonna blend with nature. The idea of going back to the land is to become more capable of providing your own subsistence. And to reduce your impact and your complicity in long chains of supply. It was saying our way of life has to change. And I loved all that because it was radical. By and large, the people who were starting rural communes people who were going, quote, back to the land in the 1960s and on into the 70s were pretty much liberal, educated college students. The naivete <laughs> of 
that was carted from college campuses out to these uh, places in the bush was breathtaking. People try to garden, imagining that they could just put seeds in the ground, or we'd have a uh, nobody's in charge, uh, put all your money into the pot, uh, kind of a social economic environment, and that would crash and burn. The women would leave, and the men would leave soon after. All of us who went out and tried to live together uh, in totally egalitarian mode got over it because we had our noses rubbed in our fondest fantasies. And you know, it only took us a couple of years. And we did no great harm in the process. It was tempting to try to throw out everything and start over. I thought about that and tried various efforts at it, uh, lived on a commune and thought about simply retreating back to the hills, spent some time in the mountains of Virginia, way up on a mountaintop. None of that seemed to be an answer. The world around us is pretty much the world we're going to have. We're either going to work with that or we're gonna lose. One peculiarity of the counterculture in the 60s was that it was inherently really anti-technology. I think it thought technology came from government, it came from corporations, and we're going back to basics, we don't need technology. Except our hi-fis, of course, and our drugs. <laughs> those could be as, you know, the more technically uh, refined those were, the better. But by and large, technology was supposed to be bad. So much of the counterculture disapproved of the space program. It was military guys with crew cuts. It was the government wasting money. Let's take care of things here on Earth before we leave it. All of this kind of rhetoric was out there, except for one guy, Jacques Cousteau, the oceans guy. He had a better sense of the, the sphericity of the Earth, probably, than any other surface-bound person at that time. What he knew was that the oceans, two-thirds, three-quarters of the planet, you could not monitor, and yet terrible things were happening to it. So his sense was that you had to have satellite imagery and people looking down on the Earth from outside in order to protect the oceans. They just said, we've got to get out there. identified with it, the whole world identified with it, and the whole world was proud of it. Once you got pride, I learned this in the Army, a whole bunch of things that seemed impossible start to seem not only possible, but let's get on with it. And there was a sense of engineering accomplishment, of being able to set a damn near impossible goal, and then just haul off and, and do it. As an astronaut, I was really emotionally invested in what was happening with the planet. Being who I was, and not just blasting my little pink body up into space, but being able to look back with my human eyes and my brain and my heart and see this planet below me, to me, you know, technology has clearly both good sides and bad sides. It's how one uses it. Apollo 9 was the first flight that flew the lunar module, and I was the first lunar module pilot. And I also went outside the lunar module. 
and it would be the first time that a human being went outside a spacecraft without an umbilical. Okay. Dave's in the command module, hanging out the hatch with a movie camera, when all of a sudden he says, um, hey, hold on, my camera just jammed. So Jim says, well, I'll give you five minutes. Rusty, just stay right there. I'm just floating there almost as if I'm naked in space. And all, all this stuff starts coming into my mind. I'm here because life has evolved on this planet. We've developed brains which enable us to invent machines. In combination with those machines, we're able to extend our environment. And here I am on the frontier of this evolutionary process. What am I? I'm a representative of life moving out into the universe. So the idea of Mother Earth that phrase has real meaning. From the outside, you can look back. The child now sees its mother. We human beings, we this life form on this incredible planet, just coated with life, where are we going? The photographs of the Earth from space were a different kind of mirror than we had ever looked in before. It flips you from the world that we're in to a planet that we're on. The image, I think, was maybe the most reproduced image in American history. We suddenly realized that the Earth was a very small thing. Much as if you live on an island, you are much more acutely aware of the limitations on your resources and on your ability to pollute. That photograph of the Earth in this vast sea of space uh, did pretty much the same thing for the whole planet.